Coach, my name is Heather Mills, and I am the first affirmative on our, our debate topic. Our topic is no fault divorce, and before I get into it, I'd like to give you a few definitions. Um, no fault divorce is a divorce in which the dissolution of the marriage requires neither a showing of wrongdoing of either party or any evidentiary, evidentiary proceedings at all. So, and I got that from um, uh, Sharon Johnson, and that was a no-fault divorce ten years later. Um, and so, essentially what this quote is saying is that, as far as um, a divorce goes, you do not have to show either party has done something wrong. You can, there's pretty lax terms as to what, um, what terms you can have to get a divorce. Um, the definition, I'm going to define fault divorce, and it is the termination of a marriage by legal action requiring, requiring a petition or complaint for the divorce by one party. Um, some of the terms in order to get a divorce under fault claims is the, the offender must co commit offenses such as money, money laundering, adultery, abuse, or other or the other must suffer mental illness that is incurable. So some sort of psychological disease that they cannot take care of. And on the affirmative, on the, on the affirmative side, we are claiming that California should get rid of no fault divorce and go back to fault divorce. So I'm going to start with a quote. Um, and it was from a British writer and he was commenting on the United States. And it said, in the Western countries, the laws governing the dissolution of marriage have been evolving over time toward making it easier for the spouse to obtain a, a divorce. And this is absolutely true in terms of no-fault divorce. So one of the first claims that, um, or one of the main reasons that they had no-fault divorce in the first place is because it was supposed to make um, it was supposed to give economic equality to both spouses, male and female. Um, however, I'm going to um, explain to you why this did not happen. I have a quote here from Lamora Weissman, and she's a, she's a professor of law at Harvard. She says that, a lot, um, <coughs> that the elimination of grounds, faults, and consent, and un and unanticipated and unfortunate had an unanticipated and unfortunate consequences on women, and she found that the decrease in women's standard of living declined by 73%. That's a fair amount. She also went on to say that 43% of women who went through a breakup of marriage had a substantial drop in their household income. So one of the reasons that um, that women income had dropped was due because of child support. And what I, what I found while doing my research is California's child support is so woefully inadequate that they could hardly cover the cost of daycare. And of those um, of those that were reported or that were mandated to pay child support, 50% of the fathers ordered to pay did not fully comply. So really, what good is is, monetar is um, child support if they're not going to pay it? How I mean, how can a woman live or be cre um, be economically equal if she's not getting the money that she deserves? Also, with the introduction of no fault divorce came a policy known as joint custody, and this is um, as probably many of you may have know is when one of the um, spouses, or ex-spouses rather, has a child for a certain amount of time, two or three days, and the other um, spouse has it for another, um, the rest of the time. And so what happened is, joint custody has increased the legal risk that comparatively, that comparatively faultless mothers may lose a greater share of the post-divorce parental control, decreasing their much-needed child support. So what happens is, because they while they may have a child for the majority of the time, they, um, they receive less money because their custody is joint. So they do not get as much child support as they would have the custody been there solely, which is common. 
And also this is a very interesting, um, very interesting point that um, I found. It compares his offspring with those continuously married parents to the offspring of divorced parents. They are more likely to drop out of high school, less likely to attend college, and more likely to be unemployed, and more likely to experience economic hardship. So the hardship isn't even, it's not even spread over just to the mothers or to the fathers. It's also spread down to the kids because they are less likely to be successful. The second main reason that no-fault divorce was put into place was to alleviate some of the hostility that placing blame would cause. However, again, this failed to be the case. Um, I have a quote from Wardle Lynn. And it says, since fighting over who caused the breakup is futile, those who want to fight now use collateral issues as battlegrounds. Fights over custody and support are, mar are more prevalent and are just as often as acrimonious and humiliating as, over those, as, over the, as those over ground, if not more so. So what they're finding is instead of making um, divorce more ho or less hostile, it's just shifting where the hostility is going. Instead of them fighting over who did what and this and that, they're fighting over how they're going to split the money, who deserves what, who deserves more. And even more importantly, they are fighting over who gets the kids, what this time, this time, and in the end, the, that is more detrimental than anything else. I also have a, a few statistics. An anthropologist, Paul Bowman, found that there was a 91% increase in custody disputes, 88% increase in reported bitterness, 92% increase in, in property disputes, and 90% increase in spousal support disputes. So, I mean, those are huge numbers. They're all right there in the 90s. That's just another, another strong fact showing that the hostility was not alleviated. So away from how no-fault divorce failed, I'm going to look at how no-fault divorce denies sacred vows of marriage and gives the contract no weight. I have some vows from you that are typically said at a marriage, um, at a marriage, and I will read them. Forsaking all others for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, in, in death to us part. But these words have no basis in reality. Under the current law, the bride and the groom are in fact promising only to be husband and wife until one of them doesn't want to be so anymore. The lifetime commi commitment which <coughs> defined marriage is gone. We've lost our timekeeper and it's been eight minutes, so I'm going to have to cut you off. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Wow, for a long time. <laughs>